Welcome back. At just 26 years old, our next guest published her first novel, Homegoing, to critical acclaim and a list of awards so long we could fill this entire segment with them. Now, our second novel, <laughs> Transcendent Kingdom, follows a young PhD student studying the neuroscience of addiction and depression while dealing with the very real challenges of both in her personal life. It's one of the most anticipated novels of the season, and author Yah Jesse is here to tell us all about it. Welcome to the show, Yah. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, what an honor and a pleasure to have you join us to talk about your newest work. Uh, you know, we're going to start going back to that first work that Jess was saying, you know, there's so many um, accolades we could fill this entire segment. Um, and in that first novel, Homegoing, you actually had a central question that really informed the novel. And that question was, what does it mean to be Black in America? With this latest novel, did you also proceed with the same idea of what is a central question that this will be built around? I didn't have um, quite the same kind of specific question for this novel, um, but in hindsight, I think one of the things that I was trying to grapple with or think through um, is what it means to make sense of a life and a world in which senseless things happen. Well, the main character in the new novel, Gifty, is a very accomplished um, academic seeking her PhD in neuroscience, yet she talks about her lifelong struggle to having to be twice as good to get half as far as a Black woman. Um, yeah, were you intent on challenging this idea? What were you hoping to get across to readers? I did want to challenge this idea and to kind of complicate our notions around this idea that I think we hear a lot in the Black community, that you have to be twice as good to get half as far. Um, and as this character learns, that goodness, um, you know, while it certainly allows her to achieve quite a bit, it makes her successful in her field, it also doesn't protect her from many of the, mm -hmm. the ills of the society that she lives in. Um, and so she finds that that, that sentiment reveals itself to be a lie. Mm -hmm. it, it ties into to the concept of respectable respectability politics when marginalized mm -hmm. groups are told to conform and behave in certain ways in order to sort of achieve better treatment, if you will. Um, do you feel that Black respectability politics have shifted given everything that's happened in the last little while, where we are culturally and politically right now? I do think that it's starting to shift. You know, I think when I was young, when I was a child, um, we were so steeped in Black respectability politics um, and that ideology around, you know, just kind of, again, this idea of, of needing your goodness or using your goodness as a way to kind of prove your value, um, which was already so misguided, um, this, this idea that hinges on this question of whether or not our inherent um, goodness, our personal achievements, um, can allow us to kind of transcend racism. Um, and, and ultimately, they can't. And so I think one thing that I've been really cheered by seeing is the fact that we are starting to kind of name Black respectability politics for what they are. Um, and we're starting to, I think, move away from, from that kind of thinking. Let's dive into how your book explores um, that, you know, not all churches are created equal, both in their practice, in their politics. Certainly with you personally, you experienced this growing up in Alabama as part of a white Pentecostal church. So religion and race. Talk to us. Gosh, let's see if we can shrink this down. <laughs> Talk to us yeah, about, uh, you know, the lines between, um, you know, that differ across racial lines and religion in America. Yeah, I saw a headline recently that said something like there is no religious left in America, um, which is such a preposterous idea because there has always been a religious left in America. Um, it just happens to be the black church. <laughs> Um, the Black Church, which was at the forefront of abolitionist movements, at the forefront of the civil rights movement. Um, I think for many people who attend Black churches, they grow up with this notion that religion and social justice are tied, um, that these two things are inextricable. Mm. Um, and, and white churches, or at least the church that I grew up in, do not seem to have this same kind of um, mandate to use their platform as a way of creating 
creating justice, um, creating equality or moving toward equality for all. Um, I grew up in a church that was incredibly politically conservative. Um, and and I really, I think, suffered from that, that understanding of my own isolation within this ideology. Um, and so it was a mm. part of the religious right. Um, and I think, and I think had I gone to a church that was predominantly black, um, my experience would be totally different. Let's stay with religion for a second, because the main character, as we said, is an academic specializing in neuroscience. And she's constantly trying to reconcile her religious self with science in the rest of her life. Now, you have a lot of experience with this tension personally. Do you feel that we exaggerate the binary between science and religion? Um, I do think that we exaggerate the binary sometimes. I don't think that it necessarily needs to be a binary. And Gifty is a character who demonstrates this really beautifully, I think. For Gifty, anytime she hears people talking about religion, um, colleagues or fellow students talking about religion as what she calls um, a comfort blanket for the dumb and the weak, mm -hmm. um, what she remembers is her mother. <laughs> and she thinks, you know, that's not true of my mother. How can we, how can we kind of put people in these boxes. Um, and so I think she's a character who's really willing to kind of exist within this spectrum and to understand that both of these, um, both of these things, religion and science, um, are ways of seeing, um, are ways of kind of mm -hmm. asking questions, transcendent questions. Um, and that is what she's ultimately interested in. Another really fascinating um, element of your novel is this exploration of the intersection between mental health and culture. And in fact, throughout your novel, you are actually citing real studies, real research <laughs> to illuminate how those two overlap, intersect. Um, and we see this, of course, play out in the characters themselves as well. What did you learn um, about this research in doing this yourself for the book? Uh, mental health and culture are really inextricable. They're, they're tied to one another. Um, and there are so many cultures that do not kind of um, pathologize or vilify um, mental health, that don't attach as much stigma and judgment towards people who are suffering from mental illness. Um, and that that we can take lessons from those cultures and kind of start to think about community-minded responses to mental health um, and think about um, mental health as a, as a health care issue, um, but also as a, as a kind mm. of culturally driven issue as well. Well, the, the main character's brother in this book suffers from addiction. And of course, the opiate crisis is currently running parallel to the pandemic in both the U.S. and Canada. Why, why did you want to focus on the opiate uh, addiction and how intentional were you about the way that you framed it? Um, I wanted to focus on the opioid crisis because like so many of, of us, I was reading about it um, and seeing so many really beautiful, sensitive, nuanced, humanizing um, reports coming out around uh, the, current, the current epidemic. Um, but I also recognized that this was a shift from talking about um, drug abuse as a criminal issue um, to talking about it as a healthcare crisis. Um, and that this shift, I think, was brought on by the fact that the people who are su suffering from this current epidemic are largely white people um, in, in rural and suburban areas. Um, and that kind of hypocrisy struck me that suddenly we were willing to kind of take some of, um, some of the judgment, some of the criminalization out of our discussions of drug abuse um, now that it was affecting the majority population. Um, and so I wanted to write a novel that had the same kind of nuanced, sensitive, um, attentive, and humanizing care paid toward um, an opioid use disorder sufferer, um, but to do so um, while placing Black families and Black lives at the center. Thank you so much for joining us today, Yeah. Thank you again. The book is called Transcendent Kingdom, and you can find it everywhere right now. And we'll be right back.